today, because of modern communication, we aspire to real-time reporting. So, you know, we will, if, if we see an atrocity that morning, our aim will be to get something out that afternoon so the atrocity doesn't recur tomorrow. Um, and it's possible to do that. You know, we, we can do investigation to publication, to being in the press, to changing government conduct in the course of a 24-hour news cycle, um, which, of course, you know, very much changes the endeavor. But it does mean that it's possible for us to take on a lot of things that were inconceivable um, in, in, in the, you know, the olden days. Um, if you look at you know, Syria today, it's obviously you know, the, the conflict is being fought with guns, of course, but it's also being fought with people's video cameras. You know, they're handheld mobile phones that are recording the, the shelling or whatever it is, putting it on, on YouTube. And, and that's you know, almost as much of a battle at this stage as the actual fighting on the ground, because that's seen as the key to the possibility of some kind of international intervention down the road. So it's, um, it's interesting how you know, communication technology has been central to the evolution, in fact, the creation of, of a human rights movement. The, um, the effect of this is, is, I think, monumental, because there have always been witnesses to atrocities. If you take the Holocaust, if you take you know, the Khmer Rouge atrocities, you know, everything, it's not as if there were no people around. There were always people there, but they had no way to communicate what they saw. And that's no longer the case. You know, if there were a Holocaust today and people saw the trains going by, they wouldn't have to just go home and, and grind their teeth. They can send an email. You know, they can, they can tweet. They can, do, you know, they, they can get word out very quickly. And so it becomes increasingly difficult for governments to hide atrocities. And the internet, this linkage of all of our, of everybody through modern communication, has um, not only made the world smaller, but made our values more powerful. Because it allows us all to shine spotlights on misconduct. And, and even the most ruthless governments have a hard time resisting that kind of pressure. Now, obviously, governments fight back. You know, China has a massive enterprise in place to try to censor this kind of communication. You see governments trying to shut down the internet at key moments, although that tends to backfire because people are very wedded to the internet and they don't like losing their access. Um, indeed, often the police use it too, and so when they shut down the, you know, the communication among the dissidents, they also are shutting down communication among the police, which doesn't work that well. There is a downside to this connectedness, and, and that is that our values are not static, our social values, our public values. So, you know, if there is an atrocity on the other side of the world and no one knows about it, it doesn't undermine our public values. But if there's an atrocity and we suddenly all know about it, but don't do anything about it, it does tend to degrade those values. And so the, the linkage you know, of, of modern communication has this double-edged component to it. it. It very much empowers those who want to use these values to constrain governments. But it also means that there's an added burden on us to then defend the values. Because if you just sort of you know, let an abuse go, the values are going to change. People are going to accept this kind of abuse as the way things are done. And... and public morality will be that much weaker. Um, I mean, you saw a bit of this after 9-11 in, in this country with respect to torture. Because, you know, if you'd asked people on September 10th, 2001, if you think torture is a good idea, you know, everybody would say, no way, you know, that's, that's just not done. Um, but, you know, within a month, people were saying, well, you know, if torture is what it takes to, to protect us, I don't know, you know, these are bad guys. And, and other things may not work. And so, you know, suddenly there was this acceptability to torture. And it was, I mean, for me, it was very scary because I saw for a while public values on this fundamental issue shifting. Now, now we fought back. And I do think that there, um, that sense that torture is wrong has been revived. But it is it, revived in a more precarious state than was the case whatever it was, 12 years ago, um, because, really because Obama hasn't gone as far as he should have, in the sense that he has stopped the torture, but for political reasons has not spent the capital to investigate and prosecute the torturers. 
And so, you know, we've been left with this very visible precedent that you can commit torture and get away with it. That's an example of how, you know, the visibility of a crime, if it's not addressed, can change our values.